Welcome. This presentation is available for MCLE self-study credit. If you would like to receive credit, you must take three actions. First, click show more text below on our YouTube page. The text will expand and show a link to download the handout materials. Once you finish watching this presentation, please click the quiz link to receive self-study credit. Once the quiz is successfully completed, you will receive a certificate via email within 72 hours. We hope you enjoy the presentation. Thank you. Great, thank you everybody for joining us today. We will go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Katie Jones with ADR Services Inc. And it is my pleasure to uh, conduct today's webinar entitled Road to Hell, Litigating with Difficult Litigants When Good Intentions Are Not Enough. Uh, so without any further ado, I would love to introduce our panelists today in the order in which they'll be speaking. Um, first, we have Alexandra Leichter. Um, since 1980, when the State Bar of California Board of Legal Specialization was established, Alexandra has been a certified family law specialist. She has developed a reputation for providing excellent representation to her clients, leaving no stone unturned, assessing each case thoroughly to ensure that the client is provided with all possible information to make a reasoned and educated decision regarding his or her case. While Alexandra has developed a reputation for being a fierce litigator, less than 10% of her cases ever see the inside of a courtroom. That is because she develops strategies and assessments of her clients' cases to assure that the case is ready to be tried, but is best resolved through mediation or settlement negotiations. In addition to regular inclusion in the best lawyers in America, Ms. Leichter was named the 2022 Family Law Legends Award recipient by the Beverly Hills Bar Association. Thank you for joining us today, Alexandra. Thank you. Um, our, our next feature speaker is Judge Lawrence Riff. Uh, Judge Riff was appointed to the Los Angeles Superior Court in 2015. His assignments have included criminal misdemeanors, civil trials, and family law home court and long cause trial departments. Before judicial service, Judge Riff was a partner of the international law firm Steptoe & Johnson LLP, where he served as the firm's managing partner for its Los Angeles office for 17 years and practice group leader for the firm's U.S. toxic tort and environmental litigation practice group. Judge Riff has written several articles on a variety of subjects, ranging from toxic tort litigation to insights into the dynamics of the family law courtroom. Thank you so much for joining us today, Judge Riff. My pleasure. And finally, we have Judge Susan Lopez Giss. Judge Lopez Giss served 15 years as a judge for the Los Angeles Superior Court with the entirety of her time on the bench devoted to family law. Judge Lopez Gist presided over thousands of cases involving all types of contested and complex family law matters, including parentage cases, custody and visitation issues, child and spousal support, business valuation, and property division. In addition to issuing thousands of rulings, Judge Lopez Gist became known for actively and successfully settling her cases. A strong legal mind, coupled with an emphasis on collaboration to resolve family disputes, has resulted in her reputation as an effective problem sol solver and adjudicator. Now with ADR Services Inc. as a full-time neutral, Judge Lopez Giss is available for mediation and private judging assignments. Thank you, Judge Lopez Giss. Thank you. Um, so I will go ahead and pull up our um, PowerPoint for the program here. And I invite you to take it away, Judge Lopez Giss. Thank you. First of all, I wanna thank ADR for hosting this program. And more important, thank the uh, panelists who agreed to this agenda. Uh, I picked this title, The Road to Hell, When Good Intentions Are Not Enough, because the fact of the matter is, out of the thousands of cases that are filed each year in the Los Angeles Superior Court, and I'm sure it's the same statewide, approximately 88 to 90% settle, meaning they don't see the inside of a courtroom. You as litigators might spend days and nights working with these clients, but the judges don't really see them. So what we're talking about is the 10%. And I think during the course of COVID, it got worse because people's expectations of their life, people's expectations of what they expected, specifically of their significant other, went up as the capacity to follow through went down. And people have become increasingly belligerent, intolerant, 
and difficult. And while the rules of court and our access to justice principles have tried to make uh, appearing in court easier with Zoom or in Los Angeles with various uh, onboard and uh, technical abilities to appear, it seems that the ability to communicate has been reduced. And so these good intentions have led to unfortunately a road that seemingly ends in our, as the family law, either litigators, uh, judges or mediators or private judges, hell. So the whole idea today is to discuss advocating your client's position towards reality, litigation tools for the judge, and finally, the benefits of mediation when the above doesn't work. And with that, we're going to start with the world-class expert in dealing with litigants, Alexander Leichter. Thank you, Judge Lopezgis. I want to first quickly do a couple of things. You were handed uh, a copy of the article I had I used to update every year. I think the last one was in 2019 because in 20, uh, COVID broke out and the LA County Bar no longer was doing it. But it's called Practical Tips on Preparing and Trying Child Custody Cases. And I reread this, this last night because I haven't read it in a long time. And I think with respect to uh, issues that litigants and attorneys face, most of it is over there. It's on that, it's like 60 pages or something. I'm sorry, it's long, but it has a lot of the law and a lot of the problems dealing with clients, a lot of the issues that you have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis if you represent a client in custody cases. The only thing that's missing I noticed was... Uh, uh, a description of the ANCA stipulation, but you can do that yourself. So having said that, I want to talk about, I want to uh, remind everyone that there are the following issues in family law cases. Property division, property determination, property issues. Who owes what to whom? How did it come about? And, and how does the court or the parties uh, divide this? Second, child custody, which is by far the most expensive type of litigation and the most uh, heartrending of litigations. And not all attorneys are or should be doing those cases to begin with. But when it comes to determining who are the, the um, difficult clients and even the difficult attorneys, it's most uh, it's most appropriate to determine that when you have custody cases, because I always feel that you have a responsibility, even though you're representing one of the parties, you have a responsibility toward the children that are uh, at issue. And you've got child support, spousal support, domestic violence, and uh, fees and costs and sanctions. Okay, those are the only areas we deal with. And it's a lot more difficult than when I started when uh, when the the judge awarded the house and the and the kids to the mother and the the business to the father and the discussion. And we had all the family law and the civil code. It is now extremely complicated. Now, what does that mean for the attorney? This complication has to be explained to the client. The client comes in with that in a way that they're absolutely uh, uh, blinded by the information you're going to give them out. And what I always tell clients is, I'm going to tell you how this works. I will give you a whole hour discussion. And everything I tell you, I'm going to be repeating at every stage of the proceeding. So it's not going to, and, and you're going to look at me each time, oh, I never heard that before. And I said, that's because people are so blinded by all this information, they don't understand, that they don't listen, or they can't take it. And it's like going to a doctor, the doctor tells you, you've got a, a cancer, and, and your eyes glaze over, and you say to the person next to you, what did he say? So in addition to the attorneys having to explain that, be very careful who you're representing. Not 
every client is worth representing. I don't care how much money they have and how much you actually are starving and how much you have to pay your uh, your own uh, associates and how much your rent is costing. Because in the end, you're the one that has to deal with these clients and you're the one that is going to be very sorry. So be very careful who you're going to be willing to represent. For example, you have you have clients who are so emotionally involved in trying to get even with the other side that they don't really hear you. And I don't mean the first time, like I told you, but over and over and over. You have clients who have had numerous prior attorneys. And by the way, they may have a lot of money to litigate. But the minute you hear that there have been more than two attorneys preceding you, throw them out, close the door, don't let them in, unless both prior attorneys died, in which case, of course, they need a third attorney. But generally speaking, if they had a problem with the first two, they're going to have a problem with you, and they're going to go on to fourth, fifth, or whatever number. Be careful about clients who insist that they know better than any prior attorney told them or that they know better than you. Because eventually they're going to say, well, I'm the client, I'm also my own attorney and what do I need you for? And I don't wanna pay you and I don't wanna pay you for all the work that you had done to begin with. So be careful about the fact that not only you might not get paid, which is of course a big problem, especially in family law, we tend to rack up a lot of accounts receivable because if you represent the non-money uh, parent or partner, you're not going to be able to get paid right away. And unless you're going to throw them out, you're going to have to wait to collect. But you may have clients who have the money but are not, are not willing to pay as they go along. I'm going to tell you right now, at the first opportunity, throw them out. Why? Because if you can't collect it now and they have the money, you're not going to be able to collect it later. Then you have the client's failure or refusal to cooperate in discovery. And this is where Judge Riff and Judge uh, Lopez Gitz are going to come in and explain to you what to do. Because this is one of the most major uh, obstructions to having a client be properly represented. And the question is, do you continue with their cases? Do you throw them out? Uh, do you fashion some solutions that you can possibly uh, go through? But it's very important to understand that when a client refuses to cooperate with you, who second guesses everything you write, who tells you that it should be handled this way or that way, do yourself a favor and do your rest of your office a failure, show them the door. Unless you think you can control it by taking the case to court or by taking it to Judge Lopez Gis to have it uh, mediated. Uh, mm -hmm. Then you have to understand there are some clients who just won't get along with the lawyer. It's just a conflict, you know, it's like not everybody is in love with everybody else and you have to figure it out one way or the other pretty early. Then the most problematic of clients are those that have personality disorders. Now, I can guarantee you that when a client walks into your office, that client is not going to say, Gee, I have an obsessive compulsive personality disorder. I have an antisocial personality disorder, so on and so forth. None of them are going to tell you that. They might say, I've been seeing a therapist. What for? I have problems. Or we have problems. Or we have something with the kids. Unless you delve a lot further, you're going to be uh, surprised and shocked at what's going to happen. Now, on the, can we go to the chart that has, I think it's number seven. Hey, Alex, before you go on, Judge Riff here, can I ask you a question? Sure. All right. Um, 
So as a judge, I've been on the receiving end of many a motion for counsel seeking to be relieved. And I understand entirely everything you said as to why it may well be a good idea to get out of the representation for with an impossible client. But I'm wondering about, could you comment briefly at least on the, maybe the ethical and the emotional tug in that situation when there are kids involved and you know you're getting out and no one else is coming in? How do you deal with that? Okay, there are, that's really two questions. Because if there are kids involved, there are a lot of attorneys who think or who have the concept that as family law attorneys, we represent the parent, unless we're minors counsel, we do not represent the kids. So whether or not it's in the best interest of the children, that's just too bad. Your obligation is toward the parent or your client. And I agree with you on one issue, and that is it may well be to the detriment of the children for you to get out, but it also will be to your detriment if you don't get out, because you may have these either personality problems, non-paying problems. You can, I've been faced with, I, I hate to say this, $800,000 in attorney's fees that never got paid, bankrupted, the, the client bankrupted. And so all because I felt I had an obligation toward the kids and to the client. Big mistake, but it happened and it happens over and over again. But there are, you know, my, my heartstrings are not as tucked anymore, um, <laughs> more recently, uh, because I understand that that client has an obligation toward their own child. They had a client has an obligation to themselves. And so if you don't get out, you're just, you, you are basically becoming the client and you're, you can't operate like that. And you also become non-functional, I think. So it, does that answer your question? It does in, in full, thank you. <laughs> okay. So um, can we have uh, the uh, number on personality disorders? I think it was- It's slide five. Oh, there it goes. There it goes. Okay, so in your slide, you have some of the personality disorders that uh, that people face. Not everybody has them. Not everybody has uh, has a large percentage of it or uh, defined personality disorder. But very often, you have a client come in, or sometimes in the middle of the case, you are you're wondering what is wrong with these people. And the one that I encounter most often, because they don't, people don't come in and say, you know, I have a personality disorder and therefore, you know, I need you to help me get my kids and I need you to help me do this and that. It's very rare for them to ever say that. But the one issue I've had repeatedly are those with borderline personality disorders. Now, I'm not going to give you all the description because I don't have time of what these personality disorders are, how, how they manifest themselves. But because I've had a number of cases with people who have per, uh, borderline personality disorders, or maybe just per, borderline personality without the disorder definition, is those are the ones that tell you you're the most fantastic, most wonderful attorney I've ever seen, I've ever had. And then they turn around and they stab you in the back because they write to the LA Times or the New York Post about how terrible you are and how the lawyers you picked or the judges you picked or whatever it may be. So these, the person, the borderline personality is a very, very difficult client to work with, I think more so than even the narcissistic personality, which everybody thinks is, is one of the worst. I'll tell you about the narcissistic personality disorder. That's the one that is most difficult and most common in custody cases and most problematic because people with narcissistic personality disorder think everything revolves around them. And children 
do not revolve around parents, much as parents think so. So when you have something like this, you're not going to go into court and say, Judge Riff, I have a client with a narcissistic personality disorder, and I want you to make a, a ruling on this custody issue, or the other side has a narcissistic personality disorder. No attorney can ever do that. What they can do is they can get a psychologist who call a psychiatrist come in and describe the personality disorder. And it doesn't matter what the personality disorder is. It has to do only with how it affects their ability to parent, their ability to function, and their ability to respond to what needs to be responded to. Now, I want you to know that uh, we, we were just discussing about how to uh, get out of this, out of these cases, how to withdraw. Um, but the, you don't even have to do that if you think at the beginning and you analyze at the beginning: is this a case that is worthwhile taking? If they want to throw a lot of money at you, but they don't tell you that they have been to a number of other lawyers, you've got a problem. And if they tell you they want certain things that are absolutely impossible or not likely, you've got a problem. And the ones that I've de dealt with the most are clients who will tell you, and I have in my retainer agreement, that I have the right to get out of the case if the client does not cooperate. Okay? What do I mean by cooperate? You've got a set of discovery documents that they have to respond to. It has been sent out uh, repeatedly to your client. Uh, answer this, answer this, give me the INE, give me the schedule of assets and debts, give me this. And uh, they either don't pay attention or they'll do it the day before the discovery is due. And it's you're ready to tear your hair out because if you're an attorney worth your weight in salt, you have the obligation to let the other side know, I've got this, uh, this is the discovery and so on. And you have to protect your client, even though the client, by the way, is not allowing you to protect them. So that's one of the things you set out at the beginning. And still, you're going to have a problem with that. And Judge Riff is going to tell you how he deals with it in court when you've got the other side who is hammering at you that the discovery hasn't been done and we want money and we want to be able to uh, understand why this hasn't been done. And we want to be able to say, um, well, I need the information and this is the information and I've asked for it over and over again and so on. Okay. Uh, I'm going to let Judge Riff talk about that because it's a pay, favorite pet peeve of mine. <laughs> mine too. <laughs> okay, take it away, Judge. Well, thank you. Uh, I see there are 419 of you out there. Um, some of you might be wondering if you're not from these parts, who is this big law toxic tort guy talking to me about family law? <clears throat> Um, let me just augment my, uh, my bio a little bit. In addition to being a family court, um, home court judge here in LA County, I eventually found myself as supervising judge of the family law division for a little bit more than two years. And I was the assistant supervising judge for about a year and a half. So, so there's that. I guess what I want to observe at the front end is that we judges don't really have a problem, don't have the same quality of problem with impossible clients that lawyers do. And we recognize that. Um, what I wanted to do was actually hold a conference today on impossible lawyers. <laughs> but Judge Lopez Guess at ADR um, wouldn't let me do that. Next one, the next that, one. Your next, the next seminar. We'll do that one, and and we'll have Alexandra speaking about that as well. She is not an impossible lawyer. She's a wonderful lawyer to have in any court. I must tell you. How much did I pay you to say that? Um, absolutely nothing. I would have said it. <laughs> I did say it for free. 
<laughs> what I want to say is that uh, from the judge's point of view, I want to put this in a little bit of per perspective. And Judge Lopez Gist has already said this, but I want to highlight it. Day in and day out, we don't see your impossible clients. The court, the, this conveyor belt of family law matters that like Lucy in the, uh, the chocolate factory that we are dealing with, 80 to 90% of those cases do not present impossible or difficult client problems. In fact, probably 70% of the cases filed in family court, we never see at all. I don't know how aware family, I guess family law lawyers are quite aware of that. You know, the cases go by default and by MSA and other things. We never see those cases. Most of the cases we see are already statistical outliers. They are the 10 or 15% of cases that need any court appearance whatsoever. And of that corpus of cases, probably 80% get off our docket after one, two, or three court appearances. What we're talking about today, from the judge's point of view, are those cases that are very rare as a statistical proposition, where there are seven, 10, 15 RFOs, multiple lawyers filing in or out, five years and the case has still not gone to judgment. Those are the matters that we see, and they're rare in our experience. That's the point I want to make. The other point I want to make is that unlike what I suspect you lawyers have to deal with, and I never practiced family law, rarely does do we judges have a serious power confrontation with your impossible client. Lawyers are moderating um, characters in the drama, Alex and others would say, now look, don't get, you know, you can talk to me this way, but don't you dare talk to Judge Riff that way, that kind of thing. Uh, and we're aware of that. But the, the bottom line is in a true power struggle between a judge and, and a difficult client, the judge is gonna win, right? Because at the end of the day, the judge can make an order and get up and walk away and go into chambers and, and we're done. And, and we know that and you know that. So the, we don't see what you see, I guess is the point I wanna make. But I also wanna make a few other points. And I'm not sure if I'm getting ahead of myself. No, go ahead. Yes, go on ahead. slides or not. From the judge's point of view, and I, I hope some of my colleagues are among the 416 of you on this. While we may project that we have this awesome power emanating from our black robes, the truth is our power is really not that awesome and we know it. It's reasonably circumscribed. One of the things we all learned back in remedies in law school, in my case, 40 years ago, is that a court of equity is not going to make an order it can't enforce. And when you become a judge, you probably know this, you go to judicial college for two weeks to learn how to be a judge. And let me tell you, right there in the first two weeks on the job, you learn, don't make an order you can't enforce. What's my point here? It, when we're dealing with very difficult or impossible family law litigants, we are going to be pretty circumspect in making orders that we either can't enforce or really don't want to turn into a contest of wills. I know that the family law bar, a constant refrain from you all is, why don't you judges enforce your orders? Why don't you make orders and enforce them? Why don't you enforce the Discovery Act? Why don't you enforce the local rules? It is not because we're unaware of them. 
And by the way, I am of the view that that's what judges should do. We should enforce the statutes, the rules, agreements, stipulations, and all the rest. We should do that. And if we're not doing that enough, shame on us. But with the most difficult litigant, we are also bearing in the back of our mind how much of this should become a sideshow of a struggle between the judge and the litigant. I'll just touch on one more point and then I'll turn it back to Alex, maybe to return to this in a moment. We have a toolbox, but, but there aren't that many tools in it when it comes to enforcing our orders. We can hold somebody in contempt, cite them for direct or indirect contempt, but now we're not a family law court anymore. Now we're a criminal court. And there's an awful lot of process that is due in the due process of a contempt trial. And suddenly we're no longer making custody orders um, and holding DV trials. Those are put aside so that we can do our, our contempt trials. Not a great use of judicial resource. What else can we do? Well, we can strike pleadings. We can impose and we can impose sanctions, evidentiary and monetary. And I will tell you that we know in the back of our minds, those are the kinds of things that get the Court of Appeal attention in family law when you start disposing of matters, not on the merits, but on forfeiture, maybe for very good reason. And it's not that we're timid to do it, or I hope we're not timid to do it. Alex tells me offline that in fact, we judges are too timid to do it, and maybe she's right. Uh, I hope I'm not too timid to do it. But again, how much process is due in those kind of due process problems uh, or situations, we are now detracting from our available time. So I guess I didn't really even answer the question, what are the tools available to us? Clear early case management orders that require people to do things, control dates, bringing them back to make sure they are doing things and making sure that your expectations are met in a graduated form of enforcement. Enforce the rules of court. You know, you hear as a judge in family law, but your honor, this is a court of equity, but your honor, it's about the children. And normally when you're hearing that, that's a lawyer or a litigant who has violated a court order or a rule of court. And yes, we need to be aware. This is not the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York. This is not a RICO matter involving the Department of Justice. We are dealing with fallible people and their, and their vulnerable children, but it's still a courtroom and rules of court apply. And sanctions is the tool the legislature has given us and they need to be applied judiciously without embroilment, but to make the point that people must do what they're obligated to do. Alex? Uh, I just take issue with a couple of things of what you said. And Imagine then I'm going to turn it over to Judge Lopez Gist because she's got a different view of how to handle these very, very difficult uh, clients. And my issue is this. If we had, I've appeared before you, I've had you hear my cases, I know exactly how you rule, and you don't have any problem ruling. Unfortunately, that is not necessarily the case with some of your colleagues, which make it very difficult. You appear in court, you have a client who, who, uh, uh, who has been waiting for for discovery, the other side doesn't give it. You file a motion. After you file a motion, they give, an, uh, give some more stuff. And the judge is sitting there. Well, they gave you some stuff. So what do you want me to do? Come back and, and uh, do it again. And again. And again. 
And I think that too many judges are afraid of being uh, overturned by the Court of Appeal. Now, I, I never went on the bench, never wanted to be on the bench. Yes, I volunteer as a temporary judge and have, have been doing that for 47 years. But as a permanent basis, I wouldn't. And if you appeared in front of me, if I were a permanent uh, judge, I would slit throats if they did not follow the rules. And that's the only way that people can understand, oh, I'm going to get in front of this judge. I better get my discovery done. I better comply with what the court ordered the first time instead of coming back two, three, four times and say, oh, well, come back again. I had a I had a godfather, a grandfather, may he rest in peace. And he always, when we complained to him that one of the cousins uh, um, hit us and he'd say, you tell him if he does it two more times. And that's the kind of answer that we get often from judges, okay? And uh, it is not satisfactory. So I'm going to ask Judge uh, Lopez Giz, what, or do you do, assuming, for example, that you can get both clients, both parties before you? I want to hear what you do with these terribly difficult clients. And they don't necessarily have to be personality disordered, just difficult. Okay, so I clearly march to a different tambourine, and I always have. I have seen being on the bench um, as an opportunity to resolve issues because as a city attorney, I helped draft the domestic violence law in this state before probably most of the people on this uh, webinar were born. But <laughs> having said that, I view family law as a conundrum in, res in many respects. There are no jury instructions. There are no... Um, specific black and white rules. There's the family code, which is underwritten or overwritten or underscored by the concept that's a court of equity. And so my view about what's been going on in our system is not because of judges who rule differently than you or I or Judge Riff would rule. It's because of discretion. And I want to go to the next slide because I see mediation as something that should be introduced early. Judge um, Tom Lewis heard this from me almost nonstop. Sometimes he wouldn't answer his phone. I suspect he retired so he could go make lots of money so he wouldn't have to take my calls about the <laughs> notion of a settlement court. I think settlement and mediation is the antithesis of uh, long cost trials. And I think right now when people are filing their cases and getting RFOs four, five, six months in advance uh, ahead of, of where we are now, if you're mm -hmm. talking about May or June, you're not helping the people. And when I say why mediation, because at this point in time, when you are getting your clients, they are angry. They are angry with nothing to do about the court system, with nothing to do with the lawyers. They're angry because they are not being heard and they have not been heard by their significant other. And then they go to court or they file their cases and they're not going to be heard soon. And so they have expectations of their lawyers to basically become their gladiators, which is not what lawyers are to be in family law. Family law lawyers, I think, are supposed to advocate for the best interest of their clients, but the best interest of their clients oftentimes are not what the clients want. What do they want? It's at the bottom of the page, either the money and or the children. And how you get there, it has to be consistent with what they've watched on The View or what they've seen on social media or what their friend who went through a similar divorce in their mind or separation or custody fight got, and you better produce the same way. And so I think that's true that they walk into your office and they are intimidated and they're nervous and they're scared and they want to hear what you are going to do for them. And once you start explaining the rules, their faces glaze over. 
because they don't know anything about the rules. They don't know anything about what is expected in court. Can I have the next slide? They have stories and the law requires admissible evidence. What are their stories? I believe he or she has got money hidden. I believe that if you knew about how many girlfriends this guy has or how many boyfriends she has, or you heard what all of the mothers at the carpool have to say, you are going to know, and I'm going to bring them in, and you're going to know what a horrible parent this person is, or you're going to know how much money this person has hidden away. And I used to say, this is a court of law. This is not a tabernacle of belief. You need admissible evidence. And admissible evidence is not a declaration that you swear under the penalty of perjury that the person has basically been cheating. Admissible evidence is evidence that shows that, number one, there is actual money in a bank account or you can trace it and not what you think. Admissible evidence is not something that the ladies from the carpool or the men from the bar have told you. It's hearsay, but it doesn't prove what you have unless you can show it. And so oftentimes when uh, litigants would come in my court and tell me that they believe this or the attorney would advocate and says, my client believes it, how are you going to prove it? How are, where is the evidence that you're going to prove it? And mediation allows you to find out that information sooner. My feeling is, is under the family code, you're supposed to, the person who's filed, filed for dissolution has to file within um, several, I think it's 60 days or 90 days. It doesn't matter what the rules are because nobody follows it. The declaration, preliminary <laughs> declaration of disclosure, nobody does it. And you're supposed to file without a, a request for admissions or interrogatories or depositions, all of the substantiating documents, but nobody does. And my belief when I was on the bench was that if you are in a point where you are requesting discovery, you should already be worried that sanctions are going to be imposed. But this is way down the line. People want to tell their story and their story, 98% of it will not be introduced into court. Can I have the next slide? There is a risk management that needs to be explain to the litigants early on. What I tell people when they would come into my court was, what you want to do right now is to go, go to Las Vegas and take all of your money or your kids and put it on one number, not a color, because a color you've got 50% of a chance of, of, of succeeding. In Los Angeles, we have 60 to 70 bench officers. We've all done the MCLE training before COVID where we sat in massive ballrooms with 10 people at a table with a clicker. And there'd be a panel on the issue of, let's say, uh, a, a financial analysis of a business. And at the end, we'd all click. How many people think that there is an actual showing of X amount of money? How many people think there's not enough information? How many people would rule in a different way? And you get the pillars. And the pillars are 28%, 30%, 40%. And they'd all sustain or would uh, uh, survive an appeal. And when you tell and explain to people that you have to prove this and you're taking a chance going in front of a judge and you do that early, I think you get people to understand how much they're spending on their lawyer versus how much they think they're going to get. And most people, when they come in front of me, have no idea how much they've spent on their lawyer. They look at their lawyer for the answer, and they have no idea how far apart they are from the other person. Next slide, please. In mediation, I believe that it, we help the parties, but most, most important, the lawyers help their clients frame the issues. Their need is to be meeting and conferring. When I would tell litigants or their lawyers, I need you to meet and confer and give me a joint statement of disputed issues before you come into court. The first time I ordered that when I was sitting in Pomona, it was almost like, I repeat, I repeat the, uh, my cousin Vinny, you were serious about that? <laughs> yes, I was serious about that. Because once you understand what you agree that you disagree about, 
you narrow the issues. More important, mediation allows confidentiality. So you know what the other party's arguments are. But the most important part about mediation is the clients get to vent. They get to tell the mediator all of the information that will never be introduced into court. And they have to be told that this is a very interesting situation you're in, but none of this is relevant. But when you have a mediator, a, 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 a individual who's done this for a long time, explaining to the parties that this is not relevant or your likelihood of success is not as great as you think it may be, you are basically backing the lawyers up. You're giving the lawyers cover. And it also gives you an opportunity to clarify your client's demand, even if you don't settle the case. Next slide, please. Can I just interrupt you one for moment. one second? Yeah, you can interrupt one second because I'm going to be done. Okay. If, <laughs> if it fails, you've had an opportunity to look at the answer book. Go ahead. Go ahead, Alex. Okay. What I wanted to, to say to add to what you had to say is the attorney has to advise the client at the outset of the case. This case may go to mediation. It may go to litigation. The uh, two of you, with the help of the other attorney, would be able to settle and so on. But I found that if you don't tell the clients in advance that this case could and should go to mediation, and there you can you can tell the judge or whoever the mediator is what your issues are, it's a lot harder to get them into mediation because they will have spent, I don't know how much money in doing the litigation. The other thing I wanna say with the mediation is that one of the things you have to advise your client about is, as, as Judge Lopez just said, clients want to say their stories. They cannot say their stories in court because most of the stories are inapplicable. Uh, the court can't take that into consideration. But once you have a retired judge who is the mediator and you are with the mediator in a private session where the other side is not there, your client has an opportunity to vent. And believe it or not, venting to a judicial officer, even if it's a retired judicial officer, takes a huge weight off of their hearts. They feel they have been heard. Now the mediator will say, you know, I really do understand what you have to say and you were really wrong than you were whatever, but I cannot take that into consideration because the law doesn't allow me blah, blah, blah. But that's the advantage of going to a mediator is your client can be heard and your client cannot be heard in a lot of that situation with a sitting judge. And, and let me add one more thing, because I'd like to have Riff's uh, opinion about this, but let me just say this. My feeling is that the, the individuals with borderline personality disorders, the individual with narcissistic personality disorders, many of the people on your list, um, I found uh, being assigned to my court, when I was sitting um, on the bench and I was convinced in department two, there was a sign rather than give me your poor and your, uh, and your tousled lo longing to be free, send all of the, people, the masses <laughs> send all the people with a multiple per personality disorder <laughs> to Susan Lopez gifts because she somehow can talk their language. And I'm sure my siblings would agree with that. But <laughs> having said that, I learned and I, I was I, I believe that if people understand earlier rather than later that there is a place they can go where they can explain and discuss all the issues because lawyers will tell me it's too soon for mediation. We haven't done discovery. My response to that is, is that discovery has little to do with diffusing a person who feels they haven't been heard. And if a person is heard, and someone explains to them, yes, you may need to find this information out. And yes, you may need to, but it may not be worth your, your while because if you think there's $5 million there, you're going to have to be able to prove that there's $5 million there. And you're going to spend the money that's from the house. that's only $200,000 in equity to go find it. 
I think that sometimes you can reach the person because the mediator has basically taken that load off your back. Judge Riff, um, you know, you sat in department two for quite a while and predominantly it was me and Judge Kaufman who were doing settlements. But was it not your experience? And this is kind of a set up question. Objection that leading. I'm sorry, right. go ahead. Was it not your Objection. experience? <laughs> was it not your experience that when you sent those types of cases to us, many times they didn't come back? Oh yeah, uh, that's absolutely the case. So I have a couple of things to say about that. First of all, for those of you who don't know what department two is, that's the um, essentially the master calendar department of the family law division in LA. Um, and Judge Lopez gets, you are right, by the way, that uh, there was a code that frequently occurred when the litigants, the lawyers, who knew that they had a particularly difficult client when they wanted to get to you because of their belief that you had a facility in dealing with such people, there'd be a code. So for example, I would hear, um, well, is there any availability in Santa Monica, which is where Judge <laughs> Lopez case was sitting? And that was code to me that that's where they wanted to go. Not that Judge Kaufman or Judge Roberts were not doing great work because they were and still are. Um, and yes, it, the answer to your question is many times. I, I mean, it's we don't even have to use vague words because as you know, Judge Lopez gives during my tenure, we started keeping track. We started keeping records of outcome of settlement and by and large, seven out of 10 matters that got sent to our settlement court did not come back. But here's my question for the two of you on this on a related point. And my, my wind up to it is as follows. <clears throat> we have essentially unlimited demand of our judicial officers in our division. I'm sure it's true throughout the state, throughout the family courts. We need more domestic violence restraining order time. Mm -hmm. We need more long cost time. We need more time for garden variety RFOs for custody and support to be heard, not three months out, but a month and a half out. And we need more settlement courts, without a doubt. And one of the terrible challenges of being a supervising judge is working with our presiding judge, how are we going to divide up and allocate those very scarce resources? And Judge Lopez, yes, I completely agree with you because you also bent my ear constantly, which was welcome, <laughs> that we needed more resource applied to settlement and certainly earlier. And I did what I could, but I, I could not do as much as I wanted or you were recommending. Here's my question from both a lawyer and settlement officer point of view. Can you compare and contrast? Well, let me, I'm sorry, I, I missed one point. And the point is this. Well, we ended up doing, at least when I was in department two, by and large, we would get people to a settlement judge pretty late in the proceeding, pretty late. And that reinforced behavior in the community in my opinion, bad behavior in the community that lawyers, many lawyers didn't feel that they needed to be ready to have a settlement discussion until late into the proceeding. So I guess my question is, Judge Lopez gives first for you and then Alex for you, would you compare and contrast for me at least and maybe others on this, in this webinar, the experience of being a settlement judge in court versus a settlement officer in the private sphere, what can you do differently? Well, just compare and contrast. I think that that question has um, made me um, convinced that my decision to leave the court 
was a good one. I was happy. I There was nothing about me being on the bench as a sitting judge that made me unhappy. I loved my assignment. I respected the attorneys, my colleagues. It was just time. I have grandchildren who want to see me, and I, I wanted to be able to have more flexibility with my life. Having said that, it ha- it took one or two cases for me to realize the incredible amount of flexibility and time I have. And people are calling um, me early on with, with clearly difficult people, people who have custody issues, who are so far apart that to say they're in, on opposite ends of the solar system is too close. They're in a different galaxy on so many issues, but the children are in the middle. And the ability to be able to deal with the people and let them talk and come up with creative solutions and have the time. I had to recess at 415. I mean, there were there were personnel mm-hmm. issues and I I went over and I would I would get chastised. But we I can go longer and I can I have the ability to call people up and talk to them and and interact with them because it, it's it's not ex party. And so the ability for me to tell an attorney, have your client, you know, get on the phone with your client and let's talk even afterwards, if, if it, if, if it hasn't resolved ultimately has led to settlements. And so my feeling is, is that the, the desire to be able to help resolve issue cases earlier rather than later is, is so much uh, more, so much more possible now. And especially because some of these people were waiting during COVID just for dates and they couldn't be seen. And I will just say one other thing. I understand we are supposed to, and it's important to be able to allow people flexibility to appear by Zoom or Hollywood Squares, the way I would call it. There is something more to be said dealing one-on-one with people and letting them come in, even if they're across a very big conference room so that they are in a safe environment, not in a courtroom that's quite intimidating and being able to be heard. So let me answer. Number one, Judge Lopez gives is 100% correct with respect to the personal appearance rather than, and I've been fighting this, you know, when you were the supervising judge, I was fighting some of this uh, appearance by Zoom and I, 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 for RFOs and motions, fine, but settlement conferences and trials, I think have to be in person, but that's my personal uh, problem. But there's one other thing. I don't know if either one of you were around when um, Judge Black was a judge in family court. He did mediations till midnight or one o'clock in the morning. He closed down the courthouse because if he felt there was a way to get those cases settled, he will do that. And he, how often I have found him in department two when he was a supervising judge and I was there at 7.30 at night, I would walk in and I said, what the hell are you doing? Go home to your kids. He says, I just have an ability to settle. I think I can settle this, okay? And he did. The third part that I wanted to say is that the problem with the settlement system, and I think this is true throughout the state because I've heard a lot of complaints about it, it comes too late. Just as Judge Lopez Giz says, I have the ability to get them at an early stage. The court does not encourage that. It doesn't say, okay, here's on your first RFO, and this is what I see, the reason what's going on here, and I'm going to do the FCRC or whatever iterations they call those things. And instead of doing that, just say, what is that issue? I'm sending you out to mediation. You're going to be there uh, with such and such, judge. number one. Number uh, two of that part is that the settlement judge who is really good at settlements should be able to do that one case, not have a backup of three, four, five cases in one day, that just doesn't do it. It's too distracting. And the parties say, oh, okay, well, I can just go home and end the discussion. So that's my answer. I do want to say there is a question and there are some questions here. We can't deal with them. 
And uh, but one of the questions, and that's that was what I had started to say at the beginning. Uh, how can you tell how a client will behave until you start representing him or her? And what if a client won't let you stop representing him or her and you can't ethically reveal any confidential information to explain why you want to stop representing the client? On a few occasions that I actually have had to make a motion uh, to, and there were direct calendaring, so I couldn't say that to the judge who was hearing the case. I would simply say there's a conflict between the client and the, the attorney. I cannot reveal what it is, but as the attorney, I can represent to the court that my ability to represent this client is nil, and I think that the client will suffer. I have never had a judge deny that, nor have I ever had a judge ask me, well, tell me what the real problem is. And of course I can't. I have an obligation to keep silent on that. But I've never had a judge refuse it, and I've never had a judge ask me specifically why. Anybody want to answer some of the other questions? Riff, would you answer the one about the concern about the Court of Appeal? Um, if I can have just a second here, um, everybody attending, this is the um, close of the hour. As our speakers have mentioned, they have a couple of minutes left to stick around um, and answer some of the questions in the Q&A. If you do need to leave um, to get back to work, you will receive the full hour of credit, but please feel free to stick around as they go through a couple of these questions. Um, you will be directed to a brief survey as soon as you sign out. We would really appreciate if you take a couple of minutes to fill that out um, and let us know how we did today and give us some ideas for future programs you might be interested in seeing. How did that hour go so fast? I know, I don't <laughs> understand this. I think their clock was too fast. Is it um, winter? <laughs> Judge Lopez, yes, help me out. What's the question? There was um, a question Realistically, how much does the fear of reversal by the Court of Appeal actually prevent you from sanctioning the lawyers who are systemic rule breakers? And if that is happening, aren't you failing in your judicial duties? Yeah, so that's a great question. I think the answer to question number one is, is really not at all. And the answer to question two is absolutely. So mm -hmm. most judges, I'll just speak for myself, I do what I do and the Court of Appeal does what, what it does. And none of us like the idea of the Monday morning quarterback who has you know, multiple weeks and months to study a record to decide if the judge made a mistake, whereas the trial judge has 15 seconds to make a decision. I mean, none of us likes to be reversed. None of us likes to be told by our friends and colleagues at the Court of Appeal that we've abused our discretion. But anybody who is afraid of being reversed shouldn't be in this job. The point okay. I was trying to make is not <laughs> that we are afraid of being reversed. The, the, the point I was trying to make is the Court of Appeal teaches over and over again that there's a lot of due process that goes into essentially a forfeiture. If a judge is going to impose a forfeiture by some sanction or even just a, a confiscation by, by a sanction, there's a lot of due process. And we're aware of that. And I guess I, I would say it's in the back of our mind that when we do that, we are necessarily going to be spending the time and effort to do that and it's going to impinge on our calendars. It should not deter us from doing the right thing. And if I said something to suggest I think it does or sh that it should deter us, it's not what I meant. I can, I can speak having worked with Judge Riff that nothing deterred him. <laughs> and, uh, I, and I, I agree. Uh, Having appeared in front of him, I agree 100%. <laughs> and, and, and I will also say that um, I, I, I think that in, in, in the process of being involved in a case, um, I can speak for myself and other colleagues that I know, you want to do the right thing. And uh, if it's going to take time and you're going to... Um, potentially realize it's a difficult issue. I agree. If we're not willing to make those decisions, 
then we shouldn't have taken the oath. And so I I feel that the reason why oftentimes the the sanctions or the responses aren't aren't imposed typically goes with the discretion of that bench officer and not because they they are worried about the court of appeals which goes back to my issue about putting a uh your bet on one number let me ask let me just pose one other question somebody said i think we should address it says can you address issues posed by proper litigants and uh, I'll let both of you uh, answer that question. But first, I want to tell you, I've sat in, as a, as I said, as a temporary judge, you know, 10, 12 times a year was enough. Thank you. For over 47 years, I've handled a small claims cases. Remember the municipal court? I've handled those cases. I do domestic violence. And I found the following. I found that if you have proper litigants on both sides, they are mostly very respectful of the court and they listen. If you can, if you don't use legalese and explain to them what the process is and then ask them questions that is not legalese, I find them to be very responsive and far less obstructionist than some lawyers. The problem really becomes when you have a lawyer representing one party and the other party is pro per, and then you as the judge feel to some extent, even though you're not allowed to, you feel like you have to uh, protect the pro per litigant by explaining to them what legally is occurring on the other side. And I have to say, depending on who the judge who's sitting there, the pro per litigant may get the short end of the stick. What do you think, Judge Riff? And then we'll ask Judge Lopez Giz. Well, I think it's a really, I think you put your finger on the real problem. It's the asymmetry of that situation where the lawyer is successfully objecting to all of the self-represented litigants testimony because it's hearsay, but then is seeking to shovel in the hearsay and the self-represented litigant doesn't know enough to say objection hearsay. It's terrible sitting as a judge watching that dynamic. What the rules of ethics teach us and the guidance we have is that we are permitted to, I'll just say, do things to enhance access to justice for self-represented litigants. But we're not their lawyers and the, the law engages in the assumption that the rules apply to everybody equally, irrespective of whether they're self-represented or not. So how much, how forward leaning a judge can be under the access to justice rubric is, to quote Judge Lopez Giz, a matter of discretion. <laughs> Judge Lopez Giz, do you want to respond? <laughs> I, I think both of you have responded well to this. I wanted to add a, a different angle to this, and that is the pro per litigants who come in with friends and um they and also represented so rep, represented litigants who come in with friends or family members, or have somebody outside on um, in the hallway, or worse, on the phone. And they take breaks, and they go back, and they come back. And on the one hand, courts are open. You can't throw people out unless they disturb. And it becomes a question of, of proof in the sense of knowing that somebody's in the back of the courtroom intimidating or um, keeping somebody from acting appropriately. So my feeling with the with self-represented litigants is is twofold. First of all, to make them understand whether they're represented um, it, when they're not represented and the other side is, that the court is going to give them an opportunity to be heard, but they've made the choice not to be represented. And so consequently, the court is not going to bend the rules or the law for them. And secondarily, with respect to that, um, many times the lawyer gets 
relieved the night before, and this could be the third lawyer that got relieved the night before, and they want a continuance. Of course, it's discretion. In my court, it rarely happened. But that doesn't mean that colleagues wouldn't see under that circumstance the opportunity to continue, which in many cases is an opportunity to basically con um, control the litigation by pro uh, prolonging it. So I think that, you know, I want the people who are listening to this and watching this to understand that we recognize there are many roadblocks in, in this path to hell. But one of the things I'm hoping that this does today is if you see this happening, raise it to the bench officer, explain to the bench officer, wait a minute, we see this as a potential problem because many times in Los Angeles and I think in other, in other courthouses, there is a turnover in family law and they may not recognize there was a history in the case. And so it's important that the bench officer understand oftentimes the history that preceded that day in court. And I, I just wanna thank everybody for attending. I want to thank um, uh, Alex and Riff for participating with us and most important, all of the people who listened and ADR for made this, making this possible. Thank you. And I want to say that Judge Lopez Giss is, is the one who twisted both Riff's and my arm to get on this panel. And I have to say, I learned a lot and I really enjoyed it. I hope everyone else did too. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much for joining us and thank you to our speakers and all of our attendees. ADR Services Inc. has been your unwavering partner in alternative dispute resolution. But as the world changed, so did we. From virtual and hybrid hearings to our ongoing on-demand CLE program, ADR Services Inc. continues to keep resolution and legal education at the forefront, woman owned and operated from the start. There is someone for every situation. We are ADR Services, Inc.